Welcome to Season 6 of the Prosthetics and Orthotics Podcast. We are absolutely thrilled to have you on board. We're talking to experts who know their stuff, the patients who've experienced these technologies firsthand, the vendors who provided the tools, and the thought leaders shaping the future. Together, we will uncover the ways to make the lives of those relying on these incredible technologies even better. We hope these discussions are going to be the highlight of your day. Welcome to the Prosthetics and Orthotics Podcast with Brent Wright and Yoris Peels. Now, uh, I'm a little jealous because Yoris is actually at Form Next. So it's going to be myself and Bo Helmrich from Digitized Designs today. So I'm really excited to have Bo on the show. Uh, we've known each other for a very long time, and he really got me into this idea of scanning being the foundation of what you do. A good scan, good data, turns into uh, good outcomes on the backside. Uh Bo is a mechanical engineer, and I'm not going to hold it against him. Did go to Clemson. Is in uh, he lives in the Greenville area. Digitized Designs is in the Greenville area. Super cool uh, building. So if you have a chance and you're in the area, uh, please go visit. He also is uh, one of the foremost, I would say, experts about scanning, and even uh, he. This is the stuff he lives, breathes and eat. And uh, I'm really excited to dive into that because I think for us and for our audience and our for our listeners, you know, people see all these different scanners. You have something from uh, the iPhone scanner where you can get a free app all the way up to something like, you know, the $100,000 scanners and then beyond for uh, the metrology and the stuff that goes into aerospace. I think it's going to be really great to break down what makes a scanner a good scanner, and then we can talk about pricing and such. So uh, welcome to the show, Bo. Thanks for having me on, Brent. It's pretty obvious that you're not at Forb next. I am and, not. Um, Love to be there. I am. <laughs> I know. And I am not at Forb next. So uh, let's talk about... Uh, what we're missing out first. I, I saw some uh, news from Art Tech releasing the micro. Cause, so can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, so it is brand new. It was launched uh, what was that? today, I believe, uh, officially. So I still don't know a ton, but uh, the little bit I do know, it's been a, it's a huge improvement from the micro one. Uh, twice as accurate, it's five micron accuracy, which is crazy. Um, so 25 microns is a thousandth of an inch. So 20% of that, um, which I think is two tenths of a thou plus or minus. It's crazy. Wow. Uh, yeah, that is crazy. Yeah. You start to get to like blood cell level once you start to get down that size. Um, but super accurate, uh, automated scanning. You hit, you put the part on the platform, you press go, it spins and dances around and it's just super easy to just kind of set it and forget it. But the biggest thing that stood out to me was the field of view is so much bigger than what was on the micro one. It's 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter by 16, something like that, which for me in inches, I actually had to look up the conversion. It was it's like eight by eight by six inches, something like that, which is volume wise, 18 times bigger than what it was before. So way more flexible. Uh, Super easy to use and super high, high quality scans. Really exciting. That is super exciting. Uh, does does that come with a massive price tag? Have they released any pricing information? So they have. I was actually surprised. So Micro One was about thirty grand. Micro Two is twenty two and a half. I expected it to be the same or more, especially with the improvements. But it's actually, come down a little bit. Wow. Wow. And and so in that space, you've got the, the 200, you know, essentially eight by eight by, uh, another, you know, six or eight. It is this, uh, kind of a game changing kind of leading, uh, edge for that volume and that specific, um, resolution. In terms of if you need that level of accuracy and that level of detail, there's really nothing else out there 
that that's able to do that. You know, you 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 quickly get up into a hundred gram plus to start achieving the same same numbers, same accuracy, all that. So it is really exciting from that standpoint. Okay, that's cool. And then then there's been some other scanning news coming out. You care to share about uh, any of that? Uh, you mean the like the shining three D new scanner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's super cool. Um, you know, we don't we don't work with any of the shining stuffs, but I, I got a couple of buddies that do, so I'm gonna have to get my hands on one of them soon. But uh, it's a blue laser handheld 3D scanner that does not require targets, which is super cool. That's very unique. Traditionally, with handheld laser scanners that are metrology grade, high accuracy, like a thousandth of an inch, you have to have targets, and in many cases, a lot of targets. So those little retroflective little circle dots, little stickers you, you have to put all over a part. Um, the scanner has to see those dots, those stickers to know where it is in 3d space. So it can actually stitch together while it's scanning. But this scanner, it's got 98 blue laser lines, just a ton of lasers does our required dots. So you get to scan freely. So that is, that's a game changer for, for parts people. The worst, the worst part about those scanners is the targets, right? There's advantages, but. It takes a lot of time to put them on and then take them off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I hate that I'm missing so on some of the the other form next dues. I've seen you know a couple things with the new materials, even some new machines coming out. Um, it appears that the acquisition market is still uh, alive and well with uh, Nexa and Essentium getting together. Pretty wild, and uh, and then just bringing it a, a little bit home to uh, news. In the O&P field is, it appears that Medicare is now going to be paying for some uh, robotic style prostheses um, the, for people that have had strokes and, and things of that nature, and even some of the exoskeleton things. And so we're going to have to be on a fast track to uh, you know incorporating that as part of our business model. So that's going to be very interesting. And that's going to actually dovetail really well into this idea of custom um, scanning and some of the stuff that you have, Bo. Um, so I think e even more and more, this idea of custom and robotics, and now we're going to have somebody like insurance companies paying for some of this because insurance companies follow what Medicare's guidelines typically are. And so as Medicare says, hey, this is something that we're going to pay for, other insurances follow. And it, it's a great thing. It's great for patients. It's also great for innovation. So I'm really excited about uh, hearing and seeing some of that stuff come down the pike. Yeah, that's super cool, man. And I, and I will say just, a, uh, I guess, kind of a sidebar. I I think what you, what you do is so cool. And just all the custom and advanced prosthetics of the stories, success stories. And just, you know, I, I'm fortunate enough, like, I don't I don't need any prosthetics, at least not at this point. Um, but I, I, I can imagine that I've heard so many stories about just how difficult it is to find things that are comfortable and it's something you got to deal with every day and the technology you put into it uh, and a lot of other people too to advance it and just make them better I think is is so cool so that's that's fantastic news yeah so that's cool well and I always tell people too like this really is a team effort you know I, I get the benefit of putting all this stuff together but it's it is uh people like you technology like this that helps harness some of that stuff I mean if we wouldn't have, you know, met a while ago, I have no idea where I would be. I would probably be trying to make an iPhone scanner work or, or something like that. But you helping us out, getting some of the stuff, the art tech, some of the training stuff, all that, it really has been a game changer for, you know, not only our clinic, but I think it also has been inspiring for others to uh, look at that technology. So it takes... It takes everybody to have these great outcomes, and uh, I think it's I think that is really neat. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So um, okay, so we talked about form next, a little bit of news. So let's let's hop in and talk a little bit about how you got started, uh, kind of on the on the road for digitized designs. Um, speak so. Uh, the, this is the other interesting thing about the Orthotics and Prosthetics podcast. We have people that are actually not in the field that listen to the podcast. They are engineers or they're they're looking for ways that they can have impact 
um, like what we do in the prosthetic and orthotic field, but also use their engineering background. So I think with you being a mechanical engineer and then obviously being on the scanning side of things, um, I think it would be beneficial for people to kind of hear your journey, not only um, in school, but then, you know, how it how it landed into finally uh, organizing and setting up digitized designs. Yeah, for sure, man. It was, um, it's funny. It's a couple of small things that kind of kicked it off and just got me in that direction, which is, is crazy. And it's cool to look back to see, you know, if, if, you know, one or two of those things didn't happen, I didn't, like you said, I have no idea what I'd be doing today. Um, but I went to Clemson, I was mechanical engineering. I had big aspirations and dreams of being an automotive a design engineer and going into school and very quickly about a year in I realized that mm, I didn't really like the engineering stuff as much as I thought I would uh there were parts of it that I like I mean I love love technology I love shiny toys right uh, just getting to play with some of those tools are, are amazing but I wasn't a big fan of all the nitty-gritty um I did like the so- solid works part of it though so uh once I was getting close to being done with school, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew it wasn't engineering. I was talking to anybody and everybody at the career fairs, uh, even like Waffle House, for example, just to try to you know, find my way, figure out what I wanted. Um, I came across a company called ScanSource in Greenville. They're just a general distribution company of different technologies, POS systems and things. Um, but I was, I won't go too deep into the story, but essentially the CEO of ScanSource introduced me to 3D printing technology. I'd never heard of it before. And um, at that point I got obsessed with 3D printing. Thought it was the coolest thing ever. I mean, it was game changing. This was uh, 2012, I think at that point. So it was, you know, about to start blowing up in the news and everybody thought they were gonna have one there, you know, in their dining room table or whatever. Um, so I got obsessed with it and I decided I wanted to get into 3d printing and, and hopefully sell 3d printers. Um, uh, scan source was starting a 3d division. I ended up getting a job with them selling 3d printers. They also had 3d scanners and I didn't know what 3d scanners were and not many people on our team did. And over time I kind of took to the 3d sta- scanning technology, ended up being kind of the 3d scanning guy when it came to sales and business development and my job was basically to go help recruit companies to sell our tech 3d scanners our tech was the brand we were carrying and again fell in love with the technology became obsessed i do have a bit of an obsessive personality when it comes to those kind of things so i tried to learn everything i could about it and my job was to recruit companies to sell the scanners help train them on how to use them how to sell them i had to go do on help them with demos and got to the point where I was having a hard time setting up a dealer in the Southeast where we are in South Carolina. And I always kind of had the itch, if you will, to start a company and felt like I saw an opportunity. So left and started Digitize Designs and, you know, seven, over seven years later, here we are. That's amazing. So, and then um, you share with us a little bit about digitized designs as well. So, yes, you carry scanners, but you also have some reverse engineering um, uh, capabilities or a lot of reverse engineering capabilities uh, as well. But uh, f- just for our listeners, yeah, share a little bit about uh, digitized designs and just what is your wheelhouse. Yeah, for sure. So I, I tell people we're a 3D scanning company. Very broad statement. We sell 3D scanners and hardware or, and software, excuse me. Uh, and I'll, I'll name drop a couple. Uh, Artec 3D, we still carry them. They're what got us here. Um, always will. Love those guys. Uh, Scantac 3D, they're handheld laser scanners. Faro is a huge name in the industry. Uh, have other softwares like Geomagic and Polyworks and some others as well. But we also do services too. So everything we sell, and we offer services with them. It doesn't always make sense for people to drop 20 grand, 50 grand, 100 grand, whatever it is on a scanning solution if they only need it occasionally. So we'll come in and do the scanning for people and just give them the scans or if they need CAD data created from scans, we'll do that. We'll do the reverse engineering to create a step file or a SolidWorks part file, whatever. Um, we'll do inspections as well. So 
you know, companies. That's a huge application for scanning as well outside of the OMP world is inspecting parts for measuring it to make sure they're within tolerance and, you know, if they're out where they're out and by how much, all that. So we do those services as well. Um, and then we do, you know, training and implementation as well. Okay. So very broad. Um, th that's cool. So you mentioned that you do the art tech scanners. So, uh, and, and the scan tech scanners and then a couple of the softwares just for our audience, can you take us down, like, what what makes the style of scanner the style of scanner? So like, you know, there's the structured light stuff. There's some of the stuff like what Apple's doing with LiDAR. There's the laser stuff. There's some hybrid stuff. So just kind of dumb it down for, you know, myself and for our listeners uh, of what these variety ways of capturing data are. Yeah, there's a few different styles. Just like with 3D printing, there's a few different styles of 3D printing as well. But with scanning, there's uh, kind of high level ones are structured light. And then you're going to have laser line, 3D scanning. You've got LIDAR, which there's time of flight and a couple other variations. Uh, Apple has, you can scan with a, an iPhone now and they say it's LIDAR. That's kind of its own conversation. And, uh, but it's, it, the the Apple phones are really good for scanning rooms and scenes. That's becoming a lot more popular in the forensics world as well. So that's really cool to see. There's uh, a guy, Eugene Lisco, I think is his name, up in Canada, doing some really cool things, really diving into the back end of everything that Apple lets you dive into with their 3D scanner. And he's got his own app and software and really sucking all the juice out of it, if you will, and just it's starting to replace some of the very high end scanners in the forensic world, which is really cool. But anyways, got a little distracted there. Um, <laughs> structured light is most of the scanners from our tech. So the way that works, it's a combination of a projector, just basically a normal projector that projects a known pattern. Uh, and then you've got a camera watching that pattern, that pattern, it's projected on an object and depending on where it is distance wise, it kind of bends and deforms over the surface and the camera watches it bend, bend and deform, turns that into measurements. And typically it's a, it's a calibrated device. So, you know, they've had a calibrated board that has been hit from different distances. So it does a bunch of math. People that are way smarter than us, we don't, we don't make any of them. We just sell them to be clear and, and know how to use them. But a lot of math to, to collect millions of measurements a second, uh, sometimes two, three, four million measurements a second, which is crazy. Then you jump over to laser line scanners. You've got some handheld versions. You've got like the ferro arm as well, also the rumor arm. Those work a little bit differently, but the, the main principle stays the same as with, with what you have with structured light. You have lasers being projected and you've got cameras watching those lasers in the form over the surface and there's pros and cons to lasers versus a projected light system structured light structured light historically has been slower and more sensitive to dark and shiny surfaces you have to powder dark and shiny parts so they can actually scan um, but the resolution has been a lot better so the detail you get and the quality the the noise level can be a lot higher with structured light traditionally. With laser line scanners, they've been faster, uh, but then have been a lot more resilient to hard to scan surfaces. So uh, dark, shiny, even chrome surfaces now are, are very easy to scan for some of the newer blue light or blue laser 3D scanners. And then I guess if you go even farther, kind of what Apple's doing with the, the phones and the other LiDAR systems, which are the more traditional LiDAR systems, sit on a tripod and then it spins around and it scans the entire room. And that's what people are using to renovate an old warehouse, for example. Go through, you scan the whole warehouse and you have that point cloud that it creates and then you can you have a, an as-built model that you can go in and, and do renovations and do planning based off of that instead of old blueprints or no blueprints at all that and you take manual measurements and you miss a pipe or all kinds of crazy things that are in some of these buildings you get that digital twin and digital twin being one of those you know, 
terms that are being thrown around a lot these days, but uh, that's becoming more and more common, even to replicate buildings and manufacturing facilities as it and kind of use that for documentation. Okay. Now, as far as uh, is infrared, uh, you know, I know that that was, uh, you know, big at one time with like the structure sensors and such. How, how did that work? Or, or is that not, is that kind of like a dying thing? No, infrared is still definitely a thing. Still, still relevant. It's, it falls into that structured light category. So structured light is a very broad term. It's, it's just the projector and a camera. The infrared side goes into the light source for the projector. So there's white light, structured light scanning. There's blue light, and it's just a blue project, projection. Then you've got VSOL, which is really a, an infrared-based projection light source. And that's invisible to the human eye, right? So we don't see, we don't see a grid being projected, but the, the camera can see that infrared grid. So diff, just a different light source. You get some pros and cons to it. Typically, those can be used outdoors in direct sunlight because they don't get flooded out by the, the direct sunlight. But okay. uh, yeah, no, that's still very much a thing. And that's that's what the, uh, the iPhones are using, especially for the face, face detection as well, is infrared. Okay. Okay. Very cool. Well, I, and I know you are uh, very humble about the. Uh, you know, your, your abilities and your team's abilities for scanning, but you guys have won some, uh, pretty cool awards too, uh, for scanning, which means that you're really good at what you do, but take our listeners down, you know, just a journey of how important it is to capture, you know, the good data and what really can take a, you know, make a good scanner, uh, or a bad scanner, good, a good scanner, bad, and what it takes to get a really good scan, good foundation, you know, good data. What what are the factors that make all that happen? Yeah, so there's there's a lot that goes into it. And unfortunately, as of right now, there's really no one size fits all scanner. Um, so there's so many different factors that come into play in terms of how big is your part? How much detail do you need? What kind of accuracy and tolerance do you need to hold? How fast do you need it? To capture data, how mobile do you need to be? Do you need to be able to scan outdoors? You know, all kinds of factors there. Uh, but so that, so how you're going to use the data is important too. If you don't need crazy high detail, then, you know, like we talked about the micro two, and that's probably overkill. Probably not going to be a good fit if you need to scan bigger parts. If you're scanning the side of a, a van or you're scanning, you know, a limb, uh, like a um, below the knee prosthetic, right? You don't need super high detail for, for those type of scans. Uh, so application is super important. But the the old saying, uh, garbage in, garbage out, holds very true with scanning, right? You want to make sure you have the right tool for what you need. If you need high detail and you use a, a low detail scanner, it's, it's just not going like, to provide a good product at the end of the day. So, so kind of matching the right scanner, right technology, to what you're hoping to achieve is super important. Um, and yeah, you got handheld scanners, you got stationary scanners. The handheld scanners are becoming more and more popular. Just they're sexy, right? They're, they're mobile, they're fast. Uh, it's pretty intuitive just to wave it around. Uh, the Artec scanners, I know we've found those to be really useful in the, the OMP world, just in terms of speed, flexibility, uh, just, ease of use and the, the data quality too. It's not crazy overkill, but the data quality is really good and really accurate. Um, some of the other stuff, like if you tried to use an iPhone, right, to scan a small part, it's just not what it's made for right now. I'm sure it'll continue to get better and you'll be able to scan small parts if you need a, a new bracket to print it, print at your house or something. One day you'll be able to do that with your phone, I'm sure. Just like camera phones back in the day, right? Super grainy, but it was cool because it was a camera on your phone. Uh, but now, I mean, iPhones today are ridiculous. But we'll, I'm sure we'll see a similar similar evolution with that. Yeah, and and speak a little bit to you know you ca you also carry the A sub sprays, which has been a complete game changer for us because we use these transparent. Um, 
sockets, test sockets, but then we also have um, sockets that say a patient has worn for years and years and years and they love it, but it's, you know, broken or, or almost broken or what have you. So we literally can spray this stuff in and scan, capture not only the inside, but the outside as well. And it disappears. Mm-hmm. How, how cool is that? So it's been great for us because we were using all kinds of tricks, but you could never get rid of the white. <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, share a little bit about how that's changed the game as well. Yeah, so powder powder sprays, talc powder, baby powder, has been used for years in the 3D scanning world. Uh, I mentioned before, dark and shiny object surfaces. Those have been really hard to scan historically transparent surfaces as well. And and the reason is the the way that most of these scanners work is it's projecting some sort of light onto the surface and the camera is watching that, whether it's the grid or the lines been in a form over the surface, watching that to get the 3D measurements. If it's a chrome surface, those, that projected light hits it and then the cameras are seeing reflections. If it's a black surface, black absorbed light, so it's just hard for the camera to see that projected light, projected pattern on the surface, transparent goes right through, right? So with the powders, with the, historically you put like talc powder on the surface to, to lighten it up, to, to give it a, a more matte white finish, which is ideal for scanning, or if it's transparent, again, gives it a matte white surface to, to lay that projection on. So you can actually get really good scan data. Unfortunately, you ended up with powder everywhere and now we have a spray. The company's called Asov. It's out of Germany. Really cool guys. Uh, they actually, the, the inventors of Asov, they used to do 3D scanning all the time. He owned a 3D scanning service bureau over in Germany. And he joked that every time he came home, it was like he worked at a bakery. But he was just covered in white powder everywhere. And it gets everywhere too. It's not, not only on your clothes, but it gets in your computers and on your scanners and you're working with lenses and none of that's ideal. But with this ASUB scanning spray, you spray it on, it goes on, matte white gives you a perfect ideal scanning surface. So your data looks awesome. But then the beautiful thing about the stuff is it just, it sublimates, it evaporates, leaving no residue on the surface. So spray it on, do your thing, and just let the, the part sit air out for an hour or two. And uh, it's like, no, it was never there. It was super cool. It's one of those things where people are still learning about it today, but once you start, it's really, it's hard to go back to just normal powder. Yeah. I was talking to somebody and they're like, oh, we just use dry shampoo. And I'm like, you you don't get it yet. <laughs> you got to try this stuff and you'll never go back. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. And dry shampoo has been used as kind of a trick too, for it to kind of evaporate and you know, for the right application, it could work. If you don't need to hold tolerances and you don't really care about the surface finish as much, and you're going for general shape, it could work. It's easy to get. It's probably cheaper too. Uh, but when you're trying to to kind of, when you're trying to get really high quality scans, that's when this stuff is awesome. It really is. It goes on nice and thin. You have good control over it. The dry shampoo, it can just, you know, that's not what it's made for. So they don't really care about the controlled spray and super even and all that so yeah it's it's two different two different world yeah well and i've got to brag on your company uh, a little bit digitized designs uh because you've done a lot even on your on your website and such where it's literally almost almost one click shopping so you know typically i'm i i will shoot you a call you or text you and say hey man i want some spray or whatever um but I remembered or I had seen something that said that the a sub spray was online and do it. So I, th- I forget it was like one or two o'clock in the afternoon. I put the order in for the a sub spray. Literally instantly I get a thing back that says, Hey, we're boxing up your stuff. And I think it was even within a couple of days, the thing shows up. It was awesome. You know, and it saved, you know, saved a phone call and all, all that stuff. So uh, good job on that. So for, for those that are listening, uh, Bo is, I mean, I think you're one of the only distributors in the U.S. for this spray, right? Yeah, one of the few. I think we, we're probably the biggest. We we stock a ton of it. We buy by the container from Germany. 
And um, yeah, thanks for the compliments on the website. We've actually, we're about to launch a brand new website. So the e-commerce stuff, especially is going to be even better, even easier. Um, and yeah, just also if anybody is interested in spray, if you use the, the code digitize, you get 5% off running a little special right now. Oh, how cool is that? Yes. Thank you. And if you, you for that. if you order by 10 AM ship same day. Wow. Okay. Cool deal. Um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, budgets for, for scanners. What can people expect? And, and does the saying you get what you pay for apply still in the scanning world or, or is it really more, what do you need and what is your budget? And let's just try to get you close. Yeah. So that's a good question. Uh, I would say, man, like 10 years ago, you get what you pay for was an understatement in the 3d scanning world. There was just, there weren't that many options. If you are going to spend 20 grand on the scanner, you might as well spend $0 on the scanner. It just wasn't worth it at that point. And then the more you spent from there, the better the quality. Now, fast forward to 2023, there's so many more options. There's so many more budget friendly options too. I mean, shine, again, we don't sell shining 3D, but that that Einstar scanner for a thousand bucks, it's crazy. It's super good. It's still not as good as what you're going to get with a twenty thousand dollar scanner. But man, before there was nothing in that ten thousand and under range that was going to give you any decent experience and any decent data. But man, that Einstar is really, really impressive for what you get. So if you're looking to play around with it, I would highly re recommend getting one of those. You know, sling it around a little bit and see what you can get. That one's cool. Um, but it, it's also, it also comes down to application too. We've talked about it still, still today. It's still not one size fits all. So there are some scanners like, like we talked about with the micro, for example, if you gas wall parts. If you've got a hundred grand to throw at it, still not, still might not be a better scanner than when, what you're going to get with the micro uh, for for that particular application. So it really just depends. But there are, I mean, there's there's options now at one grand with that nine star. There's a couple options at five grand. Over the past year or two, there's been more and more options at that ten to fifteen grand that are are starting to get a lot better too. And then um, obviously there's tons of tons of options at twenty grand plus. You can throw as much money as you want, and then you can get into CT scanning too. That's you know multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars that I think. I'm a big believer and I think CT scanning is only going to grow and become more, more attainable too. Cool. So, and then as far as like digitized designs, I know you, I, where, where would you say your, the budget starts? Like, <clears throat> so I think this is the other part that I, uh, that uh, our listeners appreciate too, is there is, yes, you can buy a nine star scanner for a thousand dollars, but there's nobody that's going to show you how to do it. And there's a, <laughs> you know, you, you have no guide, you have no uh, professional thing. And, the, and, and, you know, we have an Einstar scanner and, um, and it's one of the ones in our Raleigh office. It's the ones they, they scan the outside of CAS. It does not scan the inside of CAS, mm -hmm. uh, and it, not, not even close, but, uh, it was interesting. I had a patient come in, uh, this is about a month ago. And I was just going to do a cover. So I just needed, you know, basic scan. And one of our clinicians is really good with it. And so I had uh, her scan not only his leg, but then the, the prosthesis that we're going to put the cover over. So, you know, we scan the leg that uh, his uh, his real leg. And then what we do is we will mirror it over and then we'll scan it or um, put it onto the prosthesis. And the data looked great. I was like, wow, this is fantastic. Um, I modify the, uh, the socket for the cover and all that stuff. And it's just off a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's like, it's not on the money. And so I had my art tech Evo with me and I, and we sprayed the a sub spray on it and like the data is just awesome, right? It's great. <laughs> and it's something that I know that I'm going to be right on the money mm -hmm. with. 
And so that's the difference between $1,000 and $20,000. But there's also this idea of like professional services that come in there. So I think you do kind of get what you pay for because you got somebody to yeah. um, call. But as far as your like digitized designs and, and that sort of thing, where where would you guys say you kind of fall and start and then go up from there? Yeah, so pricing-wise, uh, pretty much the cheapest scanner we carry is 20 grand, 20 grand and up from there. And then you can go... 100 grand it kind of tops out at like one hundred and twenty thousand uh, dollars, depending on the scanner and then you can add software on top of that we're even getting into some robotic and automated scanning solutions which you know goes up from there but yeah absolutely it's a great point about you know einstar is great again it's great for a thousand dollars and that is very relative it's still not going to be near as good as your twenty thousand dollar scanner just apples to apples uh Accuracy can play a big part of it. Uh, workflow can play a big part of it. But yeah, there's people aren't going to support a thousand dollar scanner too, right? Because you know we love what we do, but we also don't do it for free either. And training is so important. Uh, it's this is new technology for most people. It's new workflows, it's new software, and you can get the best scanner in the world if you don't know how to use it correctly. You can. You can have a bad experience and you can get bad data and uh, ends up just being an expensive paperweight. So we've, that's one thing that we pride ourselves on for sure is for one, we don't just sell out of a catalog. Everything that we sell, we use every day too. And uh, we know it well, and we're not going to sell something that we don't know well, we can't support properly and train people properly. And um, training such a big deal. It's such a big deal for to have happy customers and not get angry phone calls, but also, uh, you know, we, it, it's such a good feeling too when customers down two or three down, years down the road, we don't even hear from them, but no news is good news right there. They're using it. They're loving it. It's because we got them set up right the first time and, and they're really getting their, their money's worth and out of their new tool. And and that's what it is. When you, you get up to that 20, 30, $40,000 range and they're, they're always toys, right? We always find different ways to use them, but they're tools. And you need you need to have the right tool for what you're doing. And um, and training is, is such a big part of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's dive in just a little bit to what you know about the prosthetic and orthotic application side of things. And, um, you know, keeping in mind that you, you carry the art tech scanners and the, the scan tech scanners, um, if somebody is looking to scan the body um, and some of the cast and some of the stuff that you've seen us do, uh, in the Art Tech line, you have the Art Tech Eva um, and the Art Tech Leo and the Art Tech Spider. Um, I'm not familiar with the the Scan Tech line, but uh, the, you know those ones I know have relevance in the prosthetic and orthotic industry. Um, is anything in that kind of same well let's start with those and then you can share with like hey does the scantech stuff actually have some uh, relevance to our field yeah. you know i i always say like the, i love the art tech stuff because it combines the the textures and the geometry together whatever they do in that math is is incredible it's crazy me. yeah it's crazy and there's just nothing like it and so I think that that kind of puts us in its own thing and no targets. And those those things are important to me. Right. Right. Yeah. And and just kind of just to touch on what you were talking about with our tech and what they're doing in real time, the math and the algorithms, the way those work, it is structured light. But to, to simplify, it, it's basically taking 3D pictures. And with the Leo, many times it's taking like 25 frames a second, 25 3D pictures a second. And it's stitching those together with overlapping features in real time. And uh, it is just insane what it can do. And, and really nobody is able to do it as well as they can without targets. Um, but that's what makes the Artec scanners so good in the OMP world is that they don't require targets and they scan really well without targets because nobody likes to have to put stickers, you know, on yourself and, and kind of go that way. But in terms of scanning full body scans and even limb scans, that's really going to be better suited for the Artec Eva and the Leo. 
And the Leo is really the one that's becoming more and more popular. It's the newer scanner. It's really, you know, Artec would get mad at me for saying this. It's the newer Eva, right? The Eva has been around for a while. The Leo is the newer version of it, basically. Uh, it's got the built-in screen, built-in battery. Just hit the trigger button and just point and shoot and go. It's super fast. And just in terms of being intuitive for scanning, tells that built-in screen is there. You're not having to look back at a computer screen or whatever. That's just how we've all been trained to you know, take pictures with our, our phones, right? With the, the camera right in front of us. So super easy to use. Um, and you can capture limbs and things like that very quickly and very accurately. The spider, on the other hand, it's kind of a lot smaller field of view. So not great for scanning legs, arms, things like that. It just, it's much more accurate than the Eva and Leo, but that also can bite you because small movements can, can create issues because it can't really compensate for that as well as the, the Eva and Leo. Uh, and it's just going to take so much longer because the field of view is so much smaller. But if you get into like scanning ears, actually, for example, so there's a, a doctor out in California, we'll, we'll do some ear scanning for her. She does some, some prosthetics implants for people that have these deformations in, in their ears. So we'll scan the, the good ear, if you will, send her the data. She creates the implant and whatever kind of magic she does over there. It's really cool. And then the, does the procedure and does the implant. We use the spider for that. And that's only because the, the spider is so high detailed replicating an ear and getting some of those in, intricate details, getting in that actual canal uh, of your ear is it does really well with that, but anything bigger, just not going to be a great fit. From what I'm gathering then from that is the, the this art tech suite of scanners are are great scanners the leo if you can if, if you can spring for it's kind of the it's it's a great hybrid between the eva it's not going to get the detail of the spider um but it's you're still going to be able to do some reverse engineering with the leo mm -hmm. it's wireless you can take it with you and such i mean it is a pain having all those wires with both the spider and the eva mm -hmm. i used to feel uh -huh. like i was getting dressed and undressed every time I do a scan with the Eva, <laughs> trying to be mobile because I'd have a laptop in one hand and then you got cables going from the computer and like a battery on your hip that go over your shoulder, then to your scanner and your other hand and having to walk around. And it's just well, not bad once you get used to it. It's just a, a process. And I think, you know, just for our industry, I think it's interesting it wasn't too long ago that people were spending 60000 plus on a scanner. So this idea of spending $20,000, uh, like for an Art Tech Eva, uh, yes, it's a lot of money, and we never want to forget that it's a lot of money. Um, but it is not only investment, but it will age well as well. Like this is, this is a scanner that you can use for a long time. I mean, the Art Tech Eva has been out for a long time, right? How, when was it introduced? Yeah, about 10 years ago. Okay, so... Uh, I mean, it's a lot of those scanners are still going and they're going to keep on going. Um, and, uh, you know, bragging a little bit, not only on digitized designs, but art tech, their, their turnaround time for, you know, repairs on scanners. We've, we've, um, had a few oops with ours where we've pulled them off, cracked cases, stuff, you know, and, and believe it or not, they were still scanning, but it, it just wasn't as good. Uh, and you want to have it, you know, as accurate data as possible, but, uh, that stuff turned around real quick. And I think that's the other part of this, uh, conversation too, is you get what you pay for when it comes to that, that people are very responsive, especially because you guys, oh, what level of dealer are you with them with our tech or the top level? So gold certified art tech ambassador. Something like that. Yeah, we've uh, okay. we've, we've been the top. Yeah, whatever the top <laughs> is for a long time now. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think that's uh, that's that's awesome there. So for for those that are listening, yes, twenty thousand dollars is a lot of money um, for a scanner, but it's still thirty percent of what we paid ten years ago for a way better performance. And then if you can spring for the Leo, um, you know. Why not? And the, you know, the Artec Spider, I, I, for our industry, there's really not a time that I can imagine people needing that unless they're doing 
like super high detailed fingers, but I actually get pretty good results with the, with the Eva, especially with the Artec Studio 18, um, and whatever they do <laughs> in, in, in that software is, is pretty incredible because, uh, that, that high, what is it? The HD reconstruction. Mm-hmm. Impressive. Well, pretty impressive. And, and to that, Artec. Their software is so good. There's, I, I think sometimes they pride themselves more as a software company than they do a hardware company. And they, in a way, it sounds kind of bad, but 3D scanning is really not that complicated from a hardware standpoint. If you if you kind of step back, it's just it's projectors and cameras. And, you know, projectors and cameras, they get better every year, sure. But it's really, it's the back-end stuff. It's the software that, that makes it go, the algorithms the math it's doing in real time and what it does with that data is really the secret sauce. And Artex on Studio 18 now, 18 revisions, uh, every year gets so much better. You mentioned the HD reconstruction. Um, it was two years ago, I think, maybe a little bit longer. Now they introduced HD mode. Basically what that meant was Artex figured out, introduced some AI algorithms into their software. They figured out how to use the graphics card to do additional calculations on the raw data and they effectively doubled the resolution of all EVOs and all Leos out there. So if you had had your EVO for say eight years at that point, you got this software update that if you're already on the subscription, you got it for free. You're it's like you got a new scanner overnight just because it doubled in detail. So uh, yeah, touch on that a little bit. I mean, I haven't do- dove much into the like the art tech studio 18 and the ai stuff so is it making some like are there times where you would not use the hd reconstruction no there's not it so really it's just running further calculations on those on the raw data on that raw projected light source image just basically sucking more out of it and and using the graphics card for you know gpu accelerated math compared to basically all cpu stuff uh and and in the future there's not even it probably won't even give you the option they'll probably just reuse the graphics card for all those calculations and it's just going to be normal scanning quote unquote so it's not necessarily making things up it's just it's just doing more math to, to suck more out of it and get you better data yeah um, okay. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And then one of the questions that I have, and a lot of people ask me about are the, are the different software, right? So a lot of scanning companies, you get the software for quote unquote free, yeah. um, you know, and you don't have to pay an annual subscription or whatever. That's not the case with art deck and they do frequently update. And these updates are significant updates. They're not just, Hey, we like little, little switch here and there. Um, but, uh, you know, there are some workflow differences between the two. So um, can you, like, I know there's a little bit of the scan tech interface, you know, when you're scanning a lot of times and you're going to process it, it'll automatically try to make these models watertight and that sort of thing. And while there is some automatic features to the art tech, there are a few more steps if you really want to get precise or maybe studio 18 has changed that. I'm not sure on on you know creating a more automated workflow to get the model out can you just share with our listeners a little bit about that yeah in terms of like complexity of the workflow is that what you're saying yeah like you know how you do some like global registration and things of that nature that 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 happens kind of in the background and automatically at least on the stuff that i've seen on like the scantech side or even on the shining 3d side Mm -hmm. They're they're trying to do that real time where the art tech you can do it real time, but the reality is you're better off using the raw data and putting it all together. Yeah, so that kind of comes down to the the back end principles of how those two different systems are operating. Where art tech is using no target and it's stitching those different different frames together by features. Uh, it's mm-hmm. basically best fitting uh, by color variation and geometry variation. And so it's doing that real time, which is still insane to me. Like the Leo is 3 million measurements a second and just flies. Um, but there is a level of error real time while you're scanning. And, and it does a pretty good job, but it's not perfect. So then once you get that data into Artec, 
Arctic does a really good job of not making it too complicated to process. But if you want to get into the nuts and bolts and the nitty gritty of that backend data, they give you access to it. So you can actually jump into a scan and see each individual 3D frame if you want to. If you want to split scans apart, if there's misalignments of those individual frames, you can you can go and surgically go in there. It's pretty cool. But basically, you do need to run what's called global registration with that Artec data once you're in Artec Studio software. All that's doing is it's looking at all those individual frames, doing a kind of a fine alignment at that frame level of all the frames in that scan to make sure everything is where it needs to be. It reduces and eliminates that real-time error that gets introduced while scanning. Just a dedicated process for it. The Scantech stuff and Shining and even Creoforming, all those, they can they don't have that step, but it's because they function differ differently. They're looking for targets while scanning. They're not looking for features. So it's, I like to say those type scanners that use targets are going to be better suited typically for like metrology applications, super high accuracy situations because they are used, it's a more objective way of the scanner knowing where it is in 3D space. It's looking for those stickers. It knows what those stickers are. So it knows how to place them very accurately instead of using, you know, uh, freckles on your arms and, uh, you know, muscles and veins and being able to use those different shapes. Um, so it's a little, I would say it's more complex what they're doing on the back end with our tech. Gotcha. That's kind of, I think that was a long answer for what you were looking for, but I no, hope I answered it. <laughs> no, hundred percent. No, that, that was great. Um, well, let's finish up talking a little bit. You touched on it and foreshadowed and uh, uh, the robotic side of some of the automatic scanning stuff that you're working on and really kind of pushing the envelope of putting some of these scanners on a robot arm. Can you share uh, you know, with our audience some of the stuff that you're up to? And then, uh, and then after that, after you share that, you know, do you ever see a time where something like that would be potentially beneficial to our field, the field of orthotics and prosthetics, where, you know, you have a set path, you know, you put your a patient in a specific position and you have a set path for this robot to scan. Do, does that ever make sense or is it a cost prohibitive move? So, but I want to hear about the robot stuff first and then you can kind of go into what, where my head goes. Yeah. So first off, I think robots are super cool, right? And that's the that's the little kid in me. I, 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 I've been doing this for almost 10 years with 3D scanners. I still think it's super cool. Get excited about it every day. Get excited about the new scanners, even the ones we don't carry that come out. So I just, I love the technology. And robots fall into that category. Robots are just super cool. Um, that said, I think robots are the future from like a professional commercial standpoint. People are wanting to scan more, scan faster, scan more repeatedly. It's harder and harder to find people that want to work or you're just you're trying to up production but can't afford more people or, or whatever variety of different reasons you might want to automate and use robots uh that's that's the direction especially the on the more industrial style scanning that's the direction a lot of that's going and not and it's, it's not always just to replace a person that's what the robot does is just basically imitates what you're going to do with your arm anyways what we're doing is you're not it's not anything crazy right we're just taking a handheld scanner and putting it on the end of a robot so it is automating the actual scanning portion but there can be ergonomics advantages to that right if you've got somebody that's scanning just eight hours a day you still need an operator to load a part so press go but they they now can their job gets a lot easier instead of a little bit more backbreaking if you're doing that all day um so we've got a couple different solutions some that are geared towards just smaller parts we've got one up on the website got a cool video about it. it's called the rm 300 300 just 300 millimeters basically it can scan and inspect parts that are 300 millimeters and smaller basically a foot and smaller so that's what that one's geared towards and really our goal is come with come up with cool solutions that are helpful for people but also one that's a little bit more approachable from a pricing standpoint historically if you even mention the word robot you're looking at half a million dollars and up quickly <laughs> wow uh, 
so it's still not cheap, right? That RM300, it's like 110 grand out the door, plus or minus, kind of depends on the setup. So it's still expensive, but again, it's still a tool. If you're pumping out parts every day, if you need to just measure parts constantly all day, it, it can be it can work really well. Or working on some other robot setups too that are are bigger, right? With bigger robots, bigger scanners, like putting the Leo on the end of it or putting the Antec track scan for scanning engine blocks for one company, but also maybe getting into scanning furniture and couches and things like that in more of an automated fashion. Right now, robots are still pretty expensive. There's, you know, like we use Universal Robot. They're probably, I would say, the Apple of Cobots, if you will. You, you pay a premium, but they are the best. They've been around for the longest. But there's also a lot of other brands as well. We've picked up another one called Elite Robotics, very similar to UR. Uh, they haven't been around as long, but and they don't have some of the advanced features and sensors. But what, with what we're doing with scanning, we're just replacing a human arm, if you will. We don't have to be super accurate. You don't need all the, the a bunch of the different features like pressure feedback sensors that you would use for automated sanding and things like that. So that that is all bringing the price of robotics down for scanning and for our world, which is nice. That of fifty grand for a scanner, you're looking at, or for a robot, you're looking at like twenty grand for a robot. Um, but for right now, probably still price prohibitive for your world is my assumption, unless you're really looking at higher volume, which could be a possibility, but I mean, every day it's coming down. Right? So scanners will continue to get more affordable. They'll, they'll still get better, right? They're still going to be a $30,000 scanner, but it'll be even better than what the Leo is today. But the equivalent of the Leo would be cheaper and then robots as more and more people come into that field and gets more refined there's going to be more affordable robots the software is where, where i think there's going to be the biggest room for improvement in terms of just making automatic scan paths i think ai is going to play a huge part in that instead of having to spend a lot of time coming up with scan paths so it's coming uh, it's still yeah there's still a ways to go to make it super attainable for everybody but i'm a big believer in that well, that's cool. That's cool. Super cool. And kudos to you for doing that. I mean, we've covered the kind of the gamut of of scanning styles of scanning. Anything, any anything that you think that we've missed that our listeners may benefit from, or did we do a pretty good job covering stuff? Uh, yeah, I, I think we covered a lot. I I nerd out to this stuff. This is what I do every day and love it. So I could I could talk for hours about it. So. Um, I'm sure I'll think of something else later, but if anybody ever has questions, you know, feel free to reach out, especially even if it's, it, if it's not a scanner, we don't, we don't carry. That's totally fine. We just, we're a 3d scanning company and I just like to talk about it. So always happy to answer questions. Okay. So, yeah. So for any of our listeners that are looking to reach you or reach uh, digitized design, what's the best way to do that? Where can they find you? and uh, and then interact with you as well yeah so i'm all over linkedin for sure bo helmerick with digitized designs uh you can you can send me an email directly bo.helmerick at digitized designs.com uh, if you can't figure out how to spell my last name you can also do info at digitized designs.com and that'll eventually make its way to me as well well bo thank you so much for your time today this was great i know i learned a lot uh as well and uh, yeah, thank you for sharing your experience. Yeah, man. Thanks for, for having me on. This has been fun. First time I've ever done anything like this. So it's been cool. Hey, ha how cool is that? And thank you, our listeners, for listening to the Prosthetics and Orthotics podcast. This is another episode. Thank you for joining us and have a great rest of the day.